Expensive tech doesn't usually stay expensive for long. The cutting edge of PC components grows dull within a relatively short time, only to be replaced by newer, shinier and similarly priced models. Some components might get a few years before being replaced, but CPUs, especially Intel's, get updated every year. In 2022, the i7-4930K, a CPU which cost £500 in its day, has since been superseded eight separate times, with each iteration knocking a few more quid off its resale value. Now at just £30, is it still worth picking up? Recently, I covered one of the highest-end CPUs released for the Intel X79 platform, the i7-3960X. That video is linked below if you missed it, but to sum up, it was a high-end desktop CPU targeted particularly towards enthusiasts, with more cores, cache and memory channels than Intel would put into any mainstream CPU for several more years. In fact, we're still waiting on mainstream quad channel. Come on guys, it's DDR5 now. It's got two channels per stick. Surely this is the time to think about putting it back in, right? Anyway, technically the i7-3820, 3930K, 3960X and 3970X were second generation Core i-series chips on the Sandy Bridge E architecture. The TOC to Sandy's tick was Ivy Bridge, a process shrink and IPC improvement using the same socket, bringing with it the support for PCIe 3 and 1866 RAM. With a UEFI update, even older boards like my Gigabyte UD3 were compatible with this new i7-4000 range of CPUs. The i7-4930K was the middle child, fitting in between the now-unlocked quad-core 4820K and the top-end 4960X. Six cores, 12 threads and 12 megs of cache made this an exceptionally capable production CPU for the time, though games of the era were perhaps not quite ready for it yet. Now, in 2022 going into 2023, we might actually be ready for the 4930K. Sure, we might be onto DDR5 and PCIe 4 already, and the AVX instruction sets of the Ivy Bridge era have been upgraded to AVX2 and AVX512, but I think the 4930K might still hold up. To find out for sure, I'm testing 9 games and 4 synthetic benchmarks on the aforementioned X79 UD3 with 16GB of quad-channel DDR3 2133 and an RTX 3070 to reduce the chance of being GPU limited. The CPU has been cooled with a 240mm AIO and is overclocked to 4.5GHz to match frequencies with the 3960X I reviewed last week. On reflection, while Valorant is an excellent game for CPU testing, it can't really leverage the full potential of a CPU that relies on thread counts. It barely touches hyperthreading at all, and when given more cores to work with, it seems to just split the workload among them without increasing frame rate. The 195 FPS average scored by the 4930K falls neatly between the quad core 3820 at 4.3GHz and the 6 core 3960X. Battlefield 5 is also a CPU intensive title in that a CPU can potentially ruin your experience in the game, but unfortunately whatever the 4930K has going in its favour, Battlefield isn't impressed. The 105 FPS average is within the margin of error from the 108 FPS scored by the 3960X, and like that CPU it suffers from interminably low minimums. The poor frame pacing makes this a bad choice of CPU for Battlefield 5 and sadly probably means that X79 is just a bad choice of platform for this game. On a happier note, Fortnite in performance mode seems like a much better fit, if still not a game that utilises all six cores that much. Once more, its average and 1% lows are within 3% of the 3960X, but only about 10% faster than the quad-core 3820. Fortnite can be a real power hog, with the Sandy Bridge ECPUs pulling over 150 and 100 watts respectively, 
The 4930K might be performing like the 3960X, but it's doing so with power closer to the 3820. In Overwatch 2, the last of the competitive multiplayer titles in my test suite, the 4930K again slots in neatly between the already very close previous gen CPUs at 1440, averaging a very respectable 152 FPS. At 66% scaling, the GPU limit starts to go away, and the newest CPU begins to show its quality, almost 20% faster than the 3820, and less than 10% slower than the 3960X. From what I can tell, the terrible 0.1% scores occur during kill cams, and as I previously mentioned, I played my first Overwatch match for the 3820 review, and even now, I'm still dying a lot. Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered gives us our first look at how the 4930K handles ray tracing, and honestly, it's no better than the Sandy Bridge e-chips. Without RT, the CPU handles the game's rendition of Manhattan very well, averaging 64 FPS, 30% faster than the 3820, but 20% slower than the 3960X. Clearly, that extra cash is doing something. With RT enabled, the difference closes up slightly as all three chips struggle with 0.1% scores in the low teens. I should point out that the RTX 3070 isn't at fault here. RT at 1440 is pretty GPU intensive, but the Ryzen 5 5600X runs the same settings at 70 FPS on average. Cyberpunk also gives us a chance to look at RT performance, and if anything, this is even less impressive. My non RT run is at 1440 Ultra with DLSS quality, which means a render resolution of about 950p, and yet the GPU can often still be the bottleneck in less intensive areas. The 60fps average is about 20% lower than the modern Ryzen scores at the same settings, with dips generally occurring around crowds or heavy traffic. With RT enabled, I drop DLSS to balanced to compensate a little for the extra GPU load, but the CPU usage goes through the roof across all threads. This means for a roughly 46 FPS average, down a couple of frames from the 3960X, but up almost 8 FPS from the 3820. Red Dead Redemption 2's results are truly impressive. At 1440, with the quality slider moved to the right, the GPU isn't maxed out yet, but the 4930K reaches a 56 FPS average in my run through Saint Denis, almost identical to the 3960X and 20 FPS faster than the 3820. Again, considering the price and the power usage, this is a great showing for the 4930K. My capture PC ran out of storage while recording Elden Ring, so you'll have to take my word for it on performance. And it was pretty great. The 60fps cap still isn't being held to all the time at 1440 max settings, but if it were, then this wouldn't make for an interesting test. Both averages and 1% are only a couple of frames below the 3960X, and gives a way better overall experience than the 3820. Finally, my single concession to the existence of strategy games, Civ 6's AI Benchmark, which the 4930K completed with an average turn time of 7.19 seconds, compared to 7.05 on the 3960X. To me, that seems pretty close, but I don't know what I'm talking about. And to a regular Civ player, that might mean hours or days of their life waiting for the AI.
So that all might seem disappointing, especially if you're watching my CPU reviews in order. I mean, the 3960X scored better across the board, right? Well, I'm still pretty happy with how the 4930K performed. Generally speaking, the X models of any given series, like the 4960X of the Ivy Bridge E generation, hold more resale value. The extra cache and better bin silicon push prices up pretty steeply, whereas the K models can often be had much cheaper. Factor in the more efficient architecture, and that means lower energy consumption and lower working temperatures than the 3960X, even overclocked to the same frequency. The 4960X, or the near-identical Xeon E5 1660V2, should have more performance, sure, but at the time of writing, they remain excessively expensive and probably shouldn't be considered for anyone other than a collector or a dickhead like me who likes to review old high-end stuff. Even so, I can't afford them right now, so don't expect a review anytime soon. In the meantime, at around £30, this is a comparatively excellent value CPU. As usual, I should caution against actually buying one unless you're already in possession of a good, working X79 motherboard. I have a suspicion these Ivy Bridge Extreme CPUs will be competitive with 1st and 2nd gen Ryzen, maybe even 3rd in gaming, but these are very old platforms that have potentially been in the hands of enthusiasts, and who knows what dark arcanery they've been subjected to. The alternative remains in the form of AliExpress specials, but once again, I don't have any personal experience with them, and what I've seen from Craft Computing, Mirkonst Hardware, and Tech yes City doesn't exactly fill me with confidence. Anyway, for the time being, that's all I have on the X79 platform and the 2011 socket. Depending on how well these videos are received, I might invest in a couple of the Xeons available for this socket to see if they have a place in modern gaming. Next week, I'll be looking at a slightly more familiar CPU, though one with only a third of the threads of this i7. If you missed the i7-3960X review last week, you can click the link on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.